In the music business, it's the business that keeps the music alive. Today, we don't have the church or the nobility funding music like they did in the past. So how do music musicians and their organizations survive? What is it like in the music business today? Let's find out in discussion with people who are actually in the music business. I'm Roxanne Jansen, and welcome to Music Business Artistry. Today, I'm very pleased to have with us Patrick Heaney from Heaney Violins and his colleagues, Ben Nito Cortez and Ben Richard. Thank you and welcome. So Patrick, as you start off in the uh, started off in the music business, your first thought was not to start a violin shop, right? You come from a music family. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? I do. I grew up around my father managing music stores and then owning two music stores as I was growing up. And so I had that influence in my life. And I started off working for him as a way I just wanted to help him to make his job easier and uh, fell in love with the business. Good. So I understand then you decided one day that you would like to apprentice um, as a luthier. Can you tell us what a luthier is, please? A luthier is someone that builds and or repairs string instruments. So it's a very broad term. A lot of times it's thought of as somebody that's just a builder of instruments, yeah. but it can refer to someone that restores and repairs. And so your colleagues here, besides also being musicians, are also luthiers, correct? Benito is a luthier, um, and Ben is a performer and retail manager. Okay. So they both have their own special skill sets and both incredibly valuable to the business. So we'll talk again in a minute about how your musicianship helps in, in the violin shop and the repairs. But can you tell us a little bit about your apprenticeship? That was a huge turning point in my life. I had no idea I was going down that path. Um, my father um, was good friends of a Bay Area violin shop owner and asked him if um, I could apprentice at the violin shop. And once I was there working, and working for free, you know, as, as mm -hmm. in a true apprenticeship, I was there just for, you know, I was being paid in knowledge. Right. And I discovered that I absolutely love violins and everything about the violin business, um, and especially the people that play violins, violas and cellos. I just, I found my, my tribe, so to speak. Um, and early on, when I first started working in the shop, the first few weeks, I realized I couldn't wait to get to work every day. Like I just, I was looking forward to going to work. When I got home at night, I was thinking about working. Mm -hmm. And so I had that amazing um, experience where I realized that I'd found what I love to do and it doesn't, didn't seem like work. And so. That's excellent. I think that's what everybody's looking for. Mm -hmm. And so one way I know that you helped create that at your own shop is that you made a point of hiring people who are musicians. Yes. So. Uh, Benita, what is it that you play? I play violin, I also play mandolin, but my main love has been violin. And specifically, lately I've been playing jazz violin. And you, Ben, what do you play? Uh, viola, um, and I don't want to say reluctantly violin, but my degree's in viola performance. But when mm -hmm. I started working at the shop, I definitely learned how to pick up uh, some violin and sort of improvise a little bit and uh, also fractional violins. It's like its own little <laughs> subsect of playing. You're just learning how to play little ones in different sizes and a, a five or six notes on cello when I have to. Yeah. So. Well, I can play five or six notes on cello <laughs> too, but not as well as some people who play cello, Absolutely. that's for certain. As a matter of fact, my cello playing is very bad. So, at any rate, so um, I understand that you have a roll in for us that you put together that shows what your shop looks like and is like. And in the true uh, performer's 
way. You put this together in 24 hours for us. I understand that, uh, uh, Ben, you filmed a lot of it and edited it. And Benito, I understand that you wrote some original music for yes. us for it. Yes. And of course, you're one of the stars in it as it shows your shot. <laughs> so why don't we go ahead and let's look at the roll in here of Heaney Violins, your violin shop. That was excellent. So it was wonderful that you were able to put together a little bit about the shop, but also feature some of the other people in there who couldn't be with us today. That was great. One of the things that I like that, that you can see a little bit of in that um, video, the roll-in, is that the layout, the physical layout of your shop is very conducive um, to all the aspects of your business. And so if any of our viewers ever wanted to put together their own violent shop, um, why don't you tell us some of the things that you thought of as you were putting that together, the physical layout and the foundations of your business? Absolutely. Um, one of the things um, for a violin shop that's you know, uh, a pillar or foundation of the shop is repair. And a shop that has repair in-house, they can repair the instruments they sell and they rent and so it's essential to be able to um, service what you sell, so to speak. And, and you do quite a number of the repairs. Yes. And if you're doing uh, a lot of the sales and such, how does having the repair shop help with the sales? It's extremely valuable to have that there. Um, people will come in either with their own instruments or if I'm trying to sell one of our instruments. We put a lot of effort into making sure they're all ready to go, but Sometimes, you know, oh, there's either a broken string or if a little adjustment needs to be made, I can always take it back to one of the repair, uh, one of the luthiers, and they just look at it, measure it, little adjustment, it's good as new, and I can just bring it to the customer. Being able to access that is, it's a dream. What it also means is, um, and here I must confess that I own a few stringed instruments, not that I'm any good at any of them, but we have some in the house and there are some other players in the house. but. When I first go to a shop, I want to give them a repair. I want to give them something um, so I can see how good they are. <laughs> and and honest, that's what I did with your shop. You know, I, I've been to many, but that's that's what I did with your shop, of course. I took it in years ago and was very pleased with the repair that was done, and I kept going back, and eventually that turns into sales of other instruments. Mm -hmm. So what other, uh, you were talking about foundations of the business, one of them mm -hmm. being repairs. What's another foundation of your business? So uh, rental instruments are a huge part of what we do, and having a high quality, high level of rentals that for a beginning player, they're not gonna struggle with basics, like yeah. the instrument staying in tune, being easy to play, and having high level players that work for the shop. Uh, Benito is a great example of, he play tests every one of our rentals before it goes out for a customer. Um, as our rentals come back after they've been out for a year or even longer, he checks them over, play tests, and makes sure there isn't anything that's gonna hold a player back. Good. So our rentals are a huge part of what we do and yet without the repair, the rentals wouldn't be as good as they are. Right. 
So you've got the repairs, the rentals, mm -hmm. two other foundations. Sales are a huge part of what pays the rent, for mm -hmm. sure. And at the same time, the rentals feed the uh, sale, yeah. and as does the repair. That a shop that sells instruments and bows, and <clears throat> if they can't do the work on them as things come up, something gets broken, needs adjustment, then they're really at a disadvantage. So being able to do repairs on what we sell. Right. And then um, the fourth and I'd say final, you know, of the, the group of foundation parts of the shop that I feel make for the success that we've had uh, is the lessons, the private lessons that we have in the shop. And I believe both of your daughters took lessons yes. in the shop yes. over the years. Mm -hmm. And that to have that in the community and the, the local private teachers that rent studio space, it really makes a shop complete. Um, if any one of those four pieces were missing, it would be you know, like a three-legged chair. You know, it's like, it's so, so if someone else is trying to start their own violin shop or they're trying to improve their own, they need mm -hmm. to look at those four pillars of success because you've had a successful business now for over a decade there. It, yes. It's done very well. So the four pillars there and in addition, um, I think community has been a big one for you. We've been very mm -hmm. fortunate that we live in an area where there are um, well, there are many youth uh, symphonies, as you've said. The music is active in the local schools. Mm -hmm. And so I think the community goes both ways, though, because I know that you all have been very active in helping the schools and um, in helping youth orchestras and such, and then being able to provide instruments to people as they come in. Yes. So I think it, it's a two-way street when it comes to the music community, and, and you've done mm -hmm. a good job of that. So the physical layout of the store, I want to just mention real fast before we move on to these wonderful props that you've brought here. Yes. As a, as a customer, as they walk into the door, before they even walk in, you have a glass front and your instruments are visible and they're striking and they're well lit. So I would recommend that to anybody who's uh, you know, opening a shop. And then as, right as you open up the door, there are two playing areas on either side. So if they've just had an instrument repaired, they can come out and they can test it out right there on both sides. And then there's a counter um, where obviously you can do business with people, but there's this central path that you can walk down. And so then the employees can turn off and do the luthier work and such. Mm -hmm. And then um, students can continue straight on back to take lessons. And it seems like the model way to put this together. I've never seen a shop like that. So I have to ask you point blank, are you glad you did it that way? <laughs> Does it work out for you or would you recommend any changes to anybody if they were starting from scratch right now? It works out incredibly well and um, I can't think of anything that I would do differently. Okay. It's, it's a good formula. Good. Well, you've brought some wonderful props here, and I don't know mm -hmm. which ones of you want to uh, tell us about them, mm -hmm. but uh, go yes, ahead. Tell sure. us about this poor, sad, <laughs> sad violin. Poor I mean, they're violin. supposed to look like this, right? <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I'm... I'm going to say this one's beyond repair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you know, it's crushed on the side that's been cut away. Okay. Where it's just impossible to do a repair. And so why don't we do this where mm -hmm. we can turn it around so yes. everyone else can see. Absolutely. What it actually looks like inside. Because that's, that's, that's a view that most people don't ever get to see. That's For sure. To see it like that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I realized when it was clear that it was beyond repair, mm -hmm. is that opening up this side so that you as a customer, you come in and uh, we're discussing adjusting the sound post, the little dowel inside here. Okay. Um, it's really hard to see from the outside until mm -hmm. you open up the violin and... Which you're never supposed to do. Never supposed Don't to do. Don't ever do this again. <laughs> Don't do this at home. Don't let anybody crush your violin, yes. 
So we can talk about you know the sound post adjustment and mm -hmm. how it's adjusted in relation to this other piece, the bass bar that's running the length of the top here, and how the two interact as far as for sound adjustment, the post can be moved, but the bass bar is stationary. So we okay. um, balance the sound post in relation to the bass bar, but it all has to be done through the F hole with a sound post adjuster. Okay. And so having the visual for customers has been a huge benefit. Yeah. So. To explain what you're doing. I have to say that looking at that and here if I may mm -hmm. just feeling it like this it's so flimsy and I'm reminded mm -hmm. of a violinist friend of mine who chastised me terribly for leaving a violin down within reach of young children and paying mm -hmm. the price for that mm -hmm. and she was saying don't you understand a violin is a baby would you leave a baby down with a two-year-old to take care of it would mm -hmm. you leave a baby down near the dog mm -hmm. <laughs> and I look at this and say mm, I wonder how that one got crushed but I don't think I want to know <laughs> right. right so what else did you bring so I brought a pound of horsehair, which <clears throat> it's pretty striking when it's in this form. Yes, it is. And this is enough to rehair about 80 violin bows. Wow. So it's a lot of horsehair. And it's um, one of the things in the shop that really makes the difference. Um, is the quality of materials that a mm -hmm. shop chooses. Uh, early on when I was learning uh, the bow rehairing, um, the teacher that I studied with was very adamant about go out and buy the most expensive bow hair that you can find. Mm -hmm. And th that's gonna be the best advertisement for the shop and the quality of the bow work being done because the customers, by word of mouth, they'll tell their friends, the bow rehair that I got at such and such shop is the best hair that I've ever you know had on my bow. And professional players, you know, like Benito and Ben, they know from like just the very first stroke yes. of their bow, is it fantastic hair or did a shop try and save some money on you know like because the range of price it can go anywhere from you know eighty to a hundred dollars for a pound of bow hair. Um, where we're paying in between $550 and $600 a pound. Wow. So we could save money, and presumably some customers wouldn't notice, but it's just the best advertisement is high quality materials. So anybody that's starting a business can definitely um, think about that as you know one of the foundation type things to invest in, in quality. Yeah. So how did you find this shop? Me? Yes. Um, I was introduced uh, by a friend of mine, Aaron. Uh, I was at a local uh, JC and he I just graduated from, uh, after I graduated from conservatory, mm -hmm. um, he told me that I should consider working at a violin shop and I came down and introduced myself to and Mr. Heaney. I kept on calling, he says, that's my father's name, just call me Patrick. Yeah. And uh, Still kept on calling. It was hard to break my habit of that, but um, eventually I just sort of stuck around and uh, started working just basic retail. And over time, I guess I maybe had a knack for it. But uh, yeah, and and that's something that I've noticed a lot is that if it's a good place, if you set it up right, if you're using quality and quality materials and all, the mu musicians will come and they will stay. And the fact that um, you're working on the instruments and you're sound checking them all, I, I mean, that's a good model. That's a good model for success, I think. Absolutely. So there is something that we haven't covered yet that you wanted to uh, talk about, and that is the sound of the instruments mm -hmm. and how you've done, you measure them in a different way or you, you rate them in a different way than a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that or one of you explain that for us? Yes. So we've realized for you know working musicians and you know everyone on down to beginning level that the sound of the instrument is the most important thing. Collectability and provenance, you know, those are all well and good and, and important in their own areas. But the instrument has to sound incredible. 
So from our very you know beginning rental level instruments, <clears throat> we base our selection, you know, what we decide to use for our basic rentals or advanced. Um, do they sound incredible? Because if they yeah. don't, we keep looking for a better source. And do they sound incredible to them, right? Yes. It, it, so I, I have, um, I have a musical ear, but it's not a violinist's ear or a violist's ear or a cellist's ear. So when you have someone like me walking in and trying to uh, rent or buy something from Ben, I'm saying things like, it doesn't sound right. You know, I want something that's richer. I want something that's, <coughs> and, and, but having a true musician who plays that instrument all the time come in, they're gonna use different vocabulary with you and you're gonna be able to help them a little better, right? We try to build a vocabulary. I mean, things that you've picked up, whether it's the focus of the sound or whether it's rich, they're somewhat arbitrary, but really not so much. Uh, it, every person has a different taste for what they like, and we try to take what they want and find something that fits them. So it depends, though I, I try to stay realistic and start with a price range. I don't want to bring out the nicest stuff because that has a tendency to uh, spoil people's palate. Because yes. So you've uh, so you start out with this where you're you're rating it by the sound, whereas a lot of shops rate it by the label um, or by the age of the instrument and all. So in an ideal world, what can you hear in an instrument that I can't? I have to say that it's not just the way it sounds, which is a very strange thing to say. Being a musician myself, when I'm mm -hmm. play testing these instruments how it feels to the musician. Okay. One of the reasons it might sound um, off or strange or too bright is that the instrument might be out of adjustment and we want to make sure, and, and so as, because it's out of adjustment, uh, the musician may find as she's playing it that she's having to force the sound, which, mm -hmm. you know, it just feeds, so it does what you do when you force a, a sound. If the violin is set up well, then it speaks easily. The musician is at, at ease, finding that it makes the sound that she intends, mm -hmm. and uh, it just kind of spirals from there. Yeah, and one of the things that I've noticed um, is that when a lot of people go in to buy an instrument for their child or to rent an instrument for their child, they don't take enough time to listen to you all. And I particularly noticed this years ago, sitting in the shop waiting for my daughters to come out from lessons and all that. And people would come in and say, well, you know, the teacher says she needs a three quarter size violin. Is that a three quarters? How much is that? I'll take it. And you're trying to say, well, yeah, that's a three quarter size. <laughs> you know, do you want to, do you want to listen to it? Do you want to? And, and I think that each instrument, besides being in tune, besides being a great instrument, they have being a singer, I call different voices. And and you learn to love one type of voice over another type. It's a very personal thing. So I think you should listen to a few instruments before you just walk in and say, I'll take a three quarter size or I'll take a full size and then walk out the door. So it's nice that you're rating them for sound from the very beginning so we can start off with whatever level I can afford, frankly. <laughs> And then within that, they need to listen to it. So, so you've told us uh, about the um, the rating them by sound. Is there anything else that you wanted to tell us about your shop while we're here? Anything that you feel makes it a success that other people could maybe copy in theirs? Yes, perhaps, do you have one? Perhaps the software is, is worth mentioning. Yes, we were gonna talk about the software. <laughs> Go ahead. It's. Uh, and at the heart of it, I mean, there's many different uh, point of sale systems, but for us, uh, we have one person who actually developed our software and catered it to us. And the biggest advantage is that if we need a change made, mm -hmm. it can be done in a few days. The, our workflow is not hindered by our software. If we need something done, the software can change to us, not the other way around. We don't need to acquiesce to it. So it's something that was built for us. It does everything we need, and it's something that doesn't get in the way. It's a, we can just help the customers. So that's one of the things that I would say is it's sort of a secret part of success is having something that really works for us. Yeah, 
I know in the past um, you said keeping track of all those slips of paper, trying it. it's a nightmare. <laughs> Yeah. It's a nightmare. We're in a busy shop and you've got instruments coming in and out. So We try not to write things by hand. That's uh, it's yes. stereotypical that in a violin shop you'd see a lot of hand repair tags and now everything is stored digitally and we don't lose things and there's, it's organized and people get notified. And, mm -hmm. Excellent. Anything else? So if I'm starting my own violin shop, which I'm not going to do, <laughs> but some people watching this might own one or might be thinking of it, what else? I think that you know a huge part of our recent success, and it's taken us years to get to this point, by the way, but we figured out that hiring string players as our employees, yes. string players of the violin family instruments, um, is a so huge difference. So you'll tolerate a violist. <laughs> we Fairly. will <laughs> tolerate. Lots of Actually, jokes. I have to say flat out, <laughs> violists mm -hmm. get too much grief. I agree. Violists are some too of them, true. to me, I love the viola. Mm -hmm. I love the viola. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to know that you hired a violist. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes, but string players. String mm -hmm. players, and it, it really was a turning point for us when we realized that when somebody is an accomplished player, they can speak the language, so to speak, of our customers. Yes. And it makes the interaction so much easier for the customer and everyone concerned. And it, it brings a new level to the business. And I'm incredibly fortunate the people that work at the shop, you know, that I feel like we work together. It's, it's not like they're working for the shop, it's a team. And we're all pulling in the same direction, so. And that makes it more fun as well. Mm -hmm. So. I think that's great. You know, to that you yes. can walk in and you can feel that mood in the shop. And I, mm -hmm. I think what what that does is then you pour a little more love into it and you get a little bit better product and you get people wanting to come back. Mm -hmm. So I, I really enjoy that. So if you have any last bit of advice for people, and again, starting a violin shop or whatever, any last one second piece of advice? Say something. Mm. Do the right thing. <laughs> Do the right thing. Well, that's mm -hmm. what Patrick's always Great. saying. Do the right yes. thing. So I appreciate all of you coming today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Thank being you. guests on Music Business Artistry. Thank you. Thank you.